of everything. Uh, let me remind you, this stuff you already know. Final is a week from today, late at night. Uh, most of you should go to the Union Auditorium. Uh, there's a problem session Friday afternoon at 2.15 over in Javits. And today is a Wednesday, even though it says Monday on your calendar. What? No? Okay. So, if there's, so what, what we, st we still have a lot of stuff left to review. I'm not planning to review differential equations unless people want me to, because we just did that. So really, where we left off in the review was uh, volumes. So I don't need to cover volumes anymore, right? I don't know. Huh? Series? Okay. So, uh, so let me just remind you what we're skipping. Work. Uh, do work. All right, we'll get to work. Uh, so work is almost the same as volumes, uh, except for the setting up part. So, so it's the integral of the force over the distance that the force is applied. Um, so most of these problems that people, so from, you know, start, finish. So a simple work problem would be something, so a very simple version would be something like you have a, a, a force which is, I don't know, 3x squared. So, and then you want to move, so, so x is, say, the distance, you have some, let's make it 3 over x, 3 over x squared, so that would be something like we have some object here, say we have a magnetic charge that's repelling, and we have a magnet that we want to move in here, where x is the distance. And we want to know uh, how much work it would take to move it from three units away to one unit away. So this would be very simple. It would just be the integral from three to one. The reason it's negative is because the integral will be negative and the work needs to be positive of three over x squared dx. So this would just be... Uh, what is that? 3x to the minus 2, so that's um, negative 3 over x, evaluated from 3 to 1, which is negative 3 minus, what did I do wrong? Yeah, minus 1, plus 1. Uh, okay, so something's wrong here. Uh, the one should be four, the three. Well, yeah, except the force is the other side. <coughs> um, okay, so we integrate from one to three. So then that gives me, uh, no, that was right before, wasn't it? Yeah, right, three to one. Sorry. From 3 to 1, so this is negative 3, <coughs> negative 1, I, I keep doing the same thing, uh, negative 1 plus 3 is 2. So it takes 2, whatever the right units are. So these are simple. The idea is exactly the same. The difficulty that people always have is calculating the force. So. If I tell you the force and set up the problem, you just integrate. That's easy. The difficulty that people have is, what is the work that it requires to pump water out of a tank? Or what is it the work that it requires to stretch a spring? Or something like that. So that's where the hard problems come in. Right? But the idea of work is very simple. You're just calculating 
how much work to how much effort is this? How much how much force do you need to do that? And so on. Okay. So instead of a problem like this, you tend to see things more like I don't know. Would you prefer moving something or a spring problem or what? So we're going to solve some less. Alright. You want some? Okay, so how much work is needed to pump, I don't know, water out of a conical or other shape tank? Which is, let's say, uh, height equals, I don't know, 12 uh, meters. The, the radius, uh, let's say, the diameter at the top is, I don't know, 6. Uh, and let's just say it's completely full. Well, let's, let's make it be half full. So it's full to a depth of 6 meters. And we need to know that water has a density one kilogram per cubic meter, and we need to know the force of gravity is 9.8. And we need to know anything else? Uh, that's really all we need to know. So this is really a jazzed up volume problem where we're computing not exactly the volume of this surface of revolution, but we're com computing the force that we have to use to lift something. So, in terms of the picture, this distance is 12. Here we have 6. Here we have 6. And we have this much stuff and we want it to go out. Okay, do you want the spit out to expand to extend or do you just want to spout where we're to pour off the top? Extend. Extend. How long would you like the spout to be? Two meters. Two meters. Okay. I don't understand why that makes it harder, but it seems to. Okay, so we have a two meter spout. I don't understand why the spout makes things difficult, but it seems to. Okay. So what do we have to figure out? Well, I'm just going to draw the same picture again, but in cross-section. So this is 12. I'm going to now label this as 3, because twice 3 is 6. If we have a piece, a, 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 a little slab of water at height y, so what we need to calculate is how much some water at height y needs to travel? Here's my scout, that's two. So, how far does a slab of water need to go? And what does it weigh? Because <coughs> that's really, that will tell us everything. Because we need to know the force we need to lift this. So that means we need to know how heavy is it and how far do we have to move it. So this little slab of water at height y. Looks like a little disc, 
Of course, the sides are sloped, but we can ignore that. Of thickness dx, or dy. The radius here, we don't know the radius. We want to find that. That's r. And we can use the fact that it's at height y. So we have similar triangles here. The height of the tank, since it's a cone, the height of the tank to the radius of the tank is 4, 2, 3. So that means that this little triangle here is of height y and why did I say 4 to 3? 4 to 1. So the radius is y over 4. So we have r is to, how about y is to r is the same as 12 is to 3, because these are similar triangles. The distance from here to here is 12, the distance from here to here is 3, the distance from here to here is y, the distance from here to here is r. So the ratio of this to that is the same as the ratio of this to that. So that means that cross multiplying r equals y over 4. If we had a different shape, we might use a different method to figure it out, but okay. And so that means that the volume of this is um, dy times pi r squared. volume of this little thing. And the distance it has to go is the distance from the very top, which is 14, from y to 14. Place it over here. From the height y to the height 14, which is the top. So this is really 12 plus two more for the spout. And so that means that our integral, well, we integrate the mass of the stuff, which, since the density is 1, is 1. times pi y over 4 squared times the force due to gravity, which I guess is 9.8. So this is the volume. This is the density. Huh? I'm not doing it in grams.
exactly the same concept of finding volumes of surfaces with a known cross section. The only difference is we have to multiply it by the distance it needs to go. That's it. It's exactly the same. The stuff with the spring, exactly the same. You just integrate the force over the distance it needs to be applied. Okay? Do I need to say any more about work? Yeah. Um, how come we didn't split it into two integrals from, say, 0 to 12? <coughs> okay, if you'd like, I can integrate from 0 to 6, and from 6 to 12 of 0. I meant, and then from 12 to 14. Plus the integral from 12 to 14 of 0, if you want. There is nothing you have to do. There's no water above the height of 6, so it has nothing to do. So if, let's, let's make the problem harder. Suppose this is a mixture of oil and vinegar. So the oil is at 6, and the vinegar is from 6 to 12, then we would have two integrals. We have one for the work to lift the oil. No, oil flow, sorry. The vinegar is at the bottom. No. Yeah, the vinegar is at the bottom, so we would have a different densi density. So we would integrate from 0 to 6 at the density of vinegar, and then the density from 6 to 12 for the, the oil. But other than that, it's the same. Yeah? Would those two have to the water out, the water line needs to go the middle of the Because there's no water that needs to go out between here and here. So look, look at, just consider one little slab of water. Okay? So it's hard to think of a slab of water, so think of this as plastic. I'm going to shave it up. So I chop it up into a bunch of little slabs. And the work to lift this slab from here to there is this. The amount of work, the amount of effort I need to expend to lift this little cylinder at height y is it needs to go from here to here. That's 14 minus y meters. Yes? Okay, from here to here, 14 minus y meters. How heavy is it? Well, it depends on how big it is. How heavy is it? Well, it's this times this times and, and then I need the 9.8 from gravity. So that's how much work I need to do just for this skinny little slab. The integral is letting me add up all the skinny little slabs. So there's a slab here at height 1. There's a slab here at height 1 half. There's a slab here at height 5. Each of those causes me to do a little bit of work. Up here, there's no slab. There's no work to do it. So why is the water supposed to be the water out of the That's where this comes in. If, if I put the spout right here, then there would be no work to take out this one. And in fact, if I put the spout here, then there's no work at all. I just open the tank, open the... It's negative work. Because I can put a little generator on here and get some energy out. Of it. So integrals let you add up things. What am I adding up? I'm adding up the energy, the, the work I need to do a small thing. I have a lot of small things, all of these slices. So I'm adding up the work for each of the small slices. The integral is not telling me the amount of work for any one of the slices. The integral is letting me sum up the work for all of the slices. People are still confused, I can see. I don't know why. OK. Do I need to say more about this? I don't think it will help. Okay, let's move on. Um, we talked about arc length, we talked about average value. Um, I think we've done all of the all of that stuff. Uh, so we can move on to series. Um, okay? So I'm 
I suppose I should say something about, do I need to say anything about sequences? They are just limits. So we have two objects, one of which we pay a lot of attention to, one of which we pay little attention to. So if we see something like this, uh, I, this is just a list of numbers. So something like 1 over n, n equals 3 to infinity, just means 1 third, 1 fourth, 1 fifth, 1 sixth, just a sequence of numbers. So this is called a sequence. And the typical question is, does this converge? So that's really just a limit question. So if we say, what is the limit of the sequence 1 over n? Then you calculate limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n, which is 0. So this guy converges. Um, the only difference here is these functions only take on integer values. So if we ask about something like the limit of sine of to pi n, well that's zero even though the limit of sine of n doesn't exist. So this is easy. Anybody have any? So the biggest confusion that people tend to have is they answer the wrong question when they're asked about a sequence. They, they say, oh, we have to use the ratio test or something. Those are for series. So one object we have is sequences. This is a tool we use to understand infinite series or sums. So this might make an appearance. It's small, even though it's fundamentally important. So more something we spend more time with is the idea of infinite sums, which are also called infinite series. Series is the more common word. I prefer the word sum because, because of the meaning in English. Sum makes it clear you're adding. Series is confusing to people, but too bad. This is the word that people use. And they, we tend to write them with sigma. We use n. Uh, something like... Uh, one third to the n, something like that. So for infinite sum, so this means take n equals zero, so we get one third to the zero, which is one. Then take n equals one, which means we get one third. Then take n equals two, means we get one ninth. And take n equals three, we get one twenty seventh. And keep doing that forever. And then the question is, does this add up to something? That's a 9. Does this add up to something, or does it get big, or does it do weird stuff? And that's what we're trying to solve. So for series, <coughs> this one that I wrote down, so there are some special types that we know how to add up. So for example, the geometric series looks like, well, so one that we have the formula for starts at zero, n equals zero to infinity, some constant, uh, is it usually a? I guess it is. Yeah. Some constant times the ratio to the n power. <coughs> It's not hard to figure out the formula that this is A over 1 minus R. If R is less than 1 in absolute value, so this one A is 1, and R is a third, so this guy adds up to 1 over 2 thirds, which is 1 and a half. You definitely should know how to sum the geometric series. It's important to remember the geometric series start at zero, 
So if you see a geometric series that doesn't start at zero, then you either need to adjust A to absorb it or somehow otherwise manipulate it to make it look like that. Uh, there are also sometimes telescoping series, which would be something like, so, okay, so let me remind you, really what we're doing with an infinite sum is we are calculating what do we get when we add the first term? What do we get when we add the first two terms? What do we get when we add the first three third terms? So we turn this series into a sequence, a sequence of partial sums. So in general, what we're looking at, the sequence Sn, which is I add from, oops, let's call this S, K, which means I add starting at zero or whatever the first term is up to K. <coughs> so I take A0, A1, A2, and I stop at the K term. I call that SK. And I want to say, does the resulting partial sum Does the resulting sequence, does this converge? That's really the question we're asking when we're looking at an infinite sum. Does the resulting sequence that I get when I add things together converge? So for, for a telescoping guy, we might have something like let me leave it factored uh, that looks like this where each term kills off part of the previous term. If we write out terms for this we get one half minus one plus, did I do this backwards? Uh, yeah, so this one doesn't work, okay? This one's not telescoping. So then I get one third minus one half, maybe it does. Then I get one fourth minus one third, oh, this is okay, and so on. And what happens? Well, if I stop at any stage, notice that, well, I have this minus 1 always. And then I add a half. So, so if I list the partial sums, S1 is negative a half. S2 is, well, if I just take the first two, then this half kills that half, leaving me minus 1 plus a third. S3 is minus 1 plus, uh, well, this third kills that third, but it leaves a fourth in its place, and so on. And if we look at the, the last, SK, well, not the last, but if we go for a long time, we get minus 1, and the half kills off, then the thirds kill off, and the quarters kill off, and the da 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 and then we're left with the one that didn't get killed off. So if we look at the limit, as k goes to infinity of the partial sum, this is the limit as k goes to infinity of minus 1 plus 1 over k, which is just minus 1. So we have just the first term. Yeah? Oh, okay. Yes, you're right. Doesn't make a difference. The limit's still the same. I just wrote it down wrong. Right? S3 is minus 1 plus a quarter. SK is minus 1 plus 1 over K plus 1. So thank you for fixing that. But still the limit is minus 1. Of course, I can 
fool you in some sense by making something here where this last term doesn't go to zero. Right? Where it still kills off the earlier terms, but this thing is always non-zero, so the limit won't exist because maybe this thing will grow. So you have to look a little more carefully. You can't just say, oh look, stuff cancels out. Here we go. So for example, this guy converges to minus one, but if we look at uh, well, I don't have one in mind right now. Shoot. Um, oh, it's okay. All right, so we have these telescoping guys that may cancel out. But in general, it's often hard to find sums directly. So, uh, So we develop, just like we did in for integrals and just like we did for derivatives, we develop techniques to put things together. So the, the various tests we do to see whether things converge might be the integral test. So So, even if we can't add it up, we might just ask, does it add up? And then if it does add up, then we can approximate it by something. So, for example, one thing we develop is the integral test. This says that if, well, let's just say instead of if, let's just say the sum from n equals whatever of a n and the integral from whatever of a n d n. So just you look at your term and you integrate it, these do the same thing. If the improper integral, which you get when you integrate the nth term, converges, then so does the sum. If the improper integral diverges, then so does the sum. The integral test, conceptually, is pretty easy. Just integrate the term. I guess we also see, let's call it a divergence test, which I should have said first. If the limit as n goes to infinity of a n is not zero, then the sum diverges. If it is zero, you don't know. But if the limit of the nth term is not zero, then the thing diverges. If I'm ultimately adding one all the time, then I'll get a lot of stuff. Uh, the integral test here this is for positive terms, or non-negative terms. Uh, I wrote integer. Good. And I wrote it on a board I can't lift. Also good. So, do I need to? I'll leave that up for a minute. I'll go over here. Um, running low on time, I'm sorry. Do you need me to list all these tests? Yes? Keep going? Well, because we have finite time. But okay, I'll keep going. So we have the integral test for once, uh, another one that we have is say the comparison test. So, Again, 
This is if we have a series of positive terms. Then if we have if we have something smaller that we know about, and that smaller thing diverges, then so does the bigger thing. If we have a bigger thing, and the bigger thing converges, so does the small thing. Now we need to have some things in hand to compare to, so one thing that you get right away out of the integral test is a class of series called the P-series. One over what am I doing? Yeah, one over x to the. We write it as x to the p or one over x to the p. I guess it doesn't matter. So here, if p is bigger than one, if I write it this way, from n equals anything to infinity. Uh, what did I just do wrong here? One over n to the p. That's the problem. Here, if P is big, then this converges. If P is small, it diverges. So if we have a sum of powers, P stands for power. If we have a sum of powers, and those powers are big, then the thing converges. That follows immediately from doing the integral test on this. We integrate 1 over x to the P. You see that if P is big, you get a number. If not, you don't. And so that gives us a big class of things to compare with for the comparison test. Unfortunately, the comparison test doesn't always, isn't always easy because it's sometimes hard to locate something to compare with. So maybe I should just do two quick examples. So for example, if I want to know what about the sum n equals 2 infinity 1 over uh, n cubed plus, let's see, do I want plus here? So that's smaller. So if I wanted to know about this, does this converge or diverge if I use comparison? And what do I compare to? Uh, 1 over? Oh yeah, that's a cube. For some reason I thought it was 5. Okay. So we compare with 1 over n cubed, does that tell us whether it converges or diverges? Okay, so this converges for two reasons. Since 1 over n cubed plus 5 is always less than 1 over n cubed, and the sum of 1 over n cubed is a p-series. On the other hand, if I have something like, just change that plus to a minus, I can't now use that. I still want to say it converges. So I can compare it to 1 over n squared. Blah, 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 blah. But I can always say, well, this looks like 1 over n cubed a whole lot. So there's a version of the comparison test called the limit comparison test.
which says that if I look at the limit of the ratio, and this is not Uh, this is not zero or infinity, then a and, a and b and do the same thing. for big N, then they do the same thing. So here, in this case, I would use limit comparison. Up. 
and stop somewhere <coughs> we're off from what we would get if we went up to infinity by no more than the term we didn't use. So, for example, when we put them both together, let's do the most straightforward alternating series. The alternating harmonic series. So this is uh, minus one plus a half, minus a third, plus a quarter, minus blah, blah, blah. This guy converges. Even though if I change all of these to pluses, it diverges. This guy converges by the alternating series test since 1 over n plus 1 is less than 1 over n. And the limit as n goes to infinity of 1 over n is 0. So it converges by the alternating series test. And if I stop after 100 terms, so I do minus 1 plus a half, minus a third, plus a quarter, and I do it for a long time, and I stop at 1 over 100, then this is off from if I go to infinity, less than 1 over 101. Because the term I didn't use controls everything. All the rest is smaller than that. All the sum of all the rest is smaller than that. Okay, so all of this was a setup to be able to do Taylor series and McLaurin series, which I have to cover now in six minutes. power series, I guess. Oh, I missed the ratio test. I'm sorry. Uh, when I was writing tests, don't forget the ratio test. Let me, let me write it here. Again, uh, if the limit as n goes to infinity of the sum not the sum of the next term over the current term is less than 1. So if the ratio of the next term to the current term is less than 1, then this thing goes faster than the geometric series, so the series converges. And in fact, it converges absolutely which means that both the series and if we change some of the sign, it still converges. If this limit is bigger than 1, then the series diverges. And if it equals 1, you have to try something else. So the ratio test gives you no information when the ratio is 0, when the limit is 0. I mean, is 1. Compare that to limit comparison, which was somewhere, is here, which works when the ratio is 1. So you have to keep track which is which. But, okay. So the ratio, in, for me, the two most useful tests, well, alternating series because it's easy, so the three most useful tests, the, the four most useful <laughs> I find the ratio test Limit comparison, most useful, unless there's something obvious like an alternating series or something like that. So if I'm just handed a test, a, a, a series out of the air, the first thing I try is I say, can I compare it to something? Let's try limit comparison. If I don't see what to compare it to, I try the ratio test. If that doesn't work, 
then I have to work harder and do an integral or something. Okay, so let's see if I can get Taylor series now in one minute. So, for power series, we can, or for often we can write a function as a sum of something involving x. Let me just write it this way for a minute. So we can write some function where the terms all depend on x. Usually, this will be a power series that looks like some number times some power of n. So, we can do that. The nice thing about, say, Taylor series or, or McLaurin series tells us how to find these coefficients. So, So McLaurin is just Taylor series, I shouldn't have used C, oh well, uh, where we're expanding around zero. It tells us that the function is, well, it's its value at your favorite point, let's call it A, plus the derivative at that point times how far off you are from that point, plus the second derivative at that point divided by 2 is how far off you are squared plus the third derivative at that point. I don't have enough room. I guess I go on to the next board. So maybe I can write it here. Plus the third derivative divided by 3 factorial by how far off you are cubed. Ba 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 ba. So in general, the nth derivative over n factorial by how far off you are to the nth power, and then you keep going. So for McLaurin series, a is zero. So, you can do this for a lot of series. You should know, you definitely should know, in the Florin series, for e to the x, for the sine, for the cosine, for a geometric series, Say for the log, I mean this one you can get from that. Uh, do I need that one? I mean this one you can get easily from that one. That's pretty much it. You can get the other. So if you know these, you can get pretty much all the other ones. Um, we can get them by, say, integrating and differentiating. Yeah? Could you have the bar the log? Could be on either, depending on how I say it. So, for example, on the, a reasonable thing on the easy part would be, tell me the uh, McLaurin series for sine of 2x. That should be easy. Because you know the McLaurin series for the, two, for the sine of 2, I mean for the sine of x, and you put a 2 everywhere you see an x. Something harder might be, give me the Taylor series for the sine of 2x expanded around x equals pi over 4. That's harder. Or of x squared sine 2x. Or of the integral of sine x over x. Or something where you have to do more work. So the easy part would be, tell me one of these or a minor modification of it. The hard part would be a major modification. See the difference? Um, I'm out of time, so uh, what I recommend you do, since we're out of time, is if you have more questions, um, I will be around, but I'm not scheduling office hours this week. If you want to come see me, send me an email, or give me a call, I can set up a time, post questions on Piazza. 
stuff like that. I'm holding the review session, well, the problem session on Friday. So I'm done reviewing now. If you want more reviewing, you can go bother with this.